Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, True Crime Army, I'm your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a podcast where I discuss murders committed by military members, veterans, or any murder with a military connection. But this is not a conspiracy theory podcast, and I am not an investigator. I am a storyteller telling cautionary tales to help you avoid falling prey to similar problems, if you can. Before I start today, I just want to give a few shout outs to my friends and family those who listened before I actually had a true crime army, my friends and family who had to endure me learning how to (laughs) use a microphone and learning how to edit my show and learning how to tell stories. They were the ones who listened and provided feedback. And I am just so thankful for them. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you to my husband, to my family and to my friends. And then after all my friends and family, and I can't forget my coworkers after they all helped me spread the word and help me to actually get real true crime listeners. Then Task and Purpose, which is a large military news source, they wrote an article about military murder and they really thrusted the show in front of a large audience. And I just wanna thank Task and Purpose for writing that article. I have people ask me all the time who I am and why I started this podcast. And I encourage everyone to check out that Task and Purpose piece, which I'm going to link in my show notes because that piece really sheds light on my passion for the military and my passion for true crime. All right, let's begin. Today I wanna talk about young love, college love. It's a time of discovery and bliss. But when one half of the couple is part of the Reserve Officer Training Corps, or ROTC, or ROTC as it is often called, the other half of the couple may not realize what they're actually signing up for when they agree to forever with the military member. And this is where Bethany Decker found herself after she discovered how lonely being a military spouse really was. She was 21 years old, a mother of a one-year-old, and a wife to a husband who had been called away to war. So she found companionship with someone who gave her too much attention. Join me today as I discuss the 2011 disappearance of Bethany Decker. Now, let's dig in. The sources for the story come from True Crime Daily, Crime Watch, Investigation Discovery's Disappearance, The Charlie Project, Military Justice for All, WTOP, ThePatch.com, Daily News, and The Nancy Grace Show. Bethany Ann Littlejohn is the oldest in her family born on May 13, 1989 in Hawaii. According to her friends, she is vibrant and full of life and always has a smile on her face. Her goal in life is to make a greater change in the world. At the time of our story in 2011, she was a student at George Mason University studying global environmental change. And it was here at GMU where she would meet a young, attractive college student named Emil Decker. He was in the ROTC program and he was aspiring to enter into the Army National Guard as an officer. The young couple dated for three years before they were surprised to find out that they were expecting a baby boy. So they did what a lot of people who are young, pregnant and afraid do. They got married. And a few months later, Kai, their son, was born. Life was hard for the young couple raising a small child, but they made it work, although the marriage was strained. At one point in the young marriage, Bethany began to have, she began to have these like doubts. And she told Emil that she thought that they had made a terrible mistake in getting married and having a baby. And she was beginning to think that she just couldn't handle it. But he assured her, this phase in life will pass. By late summer of 2010, Emil was deployed to Afghanistan and Bethany stayed back in her fourth floor apartment in Orchard Grass Terrace in Ashburn, Virginia. She was left alone to raise her one-year-old son while finishing up her college degree in the spring of 2011. But Bethany was determined to make it work. She was like, "Okay, I got this. I'm going to raise this kid and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to finish my degree. And in addition to doing all of that and being a temporary single mom, She also worked a night shift at Carabas in Centerville, Virginia as a waitress. And it was through her waitressing gig at Carabas that she met Ronald Rolden, one of her coworkers, and they began chatting and they really seemed to hit it off. Before long, Bethany was sharing information about Ronald with her friend. 
And her friend just couldn't believe that Bethany was even contemplating an affair, but her friend supported her and realized how lonely Bethany actually was. Bethany soon invited Ronald to move in with her and her son because she thought that it would be nice to have somebody around the house who can basically help around the house and help babysit Kai. Now, Ronald, he had four kids of his own by three separate women, and his kids would occasionally come over, so it was almost like she kind of had this idea that they were going to be a big, happy family. Bethany's friends who met Ronald thought that he was nice at first, but things soon changed, and friends and family realized that Bethany was no longer the free spirit and kind of like independent person that she was before Ronald. Now, whenever she was out with her friends, she was glued to her cell phone and constantly sending Ronald pictures to prove that she was where she said she was. Let's say, for example, she she told Ronald that she was going to Applebee's to have dinner with her friends. She would literally have to take pictures in front of like the Applebee sign with her friends so that he knew exactly where she was. And soon things would get even stranger. A few odd things began happening involving Kai, which is Bethany's son. And the things that happened to him would or should give anyone pause. As reported by the Daily Mail, on Kai's first birthday, he had two black eyes. Kim, Bethany's mother, said, quote, The story they told me was that someone who doesn't have kids was watching Kai when he was sitting on a chair and he fell backwards, end quote. Hmm, but something else. Kim's parents, meaning Kai's great-grandparents, also recall Kai appearing very afraid when he was around Ronald. On another occasion, Kai's daycare called Bethany to report that a man had called the daycare saying that he was Emil. It's unclear what the man was calling the daycare for, but at the time, Emil, who was Kai's father, was deployed in Afghanistan, so there was no way that it was him. And so Bethany started freaking out because she knew it was Ronald who had called and pretended to be Emil. And this really freaked out Bethany and Kim. So they had to come up with like a code word with a daycare that would be used for anyone to actually pick Kai up from school. So it could be for this reason or many other reasons that Bethany, while her husband was deployed, asked her mom, Kim, if she would be able to take Kai for the remainder of the time while she was single parenting and working and going to school, if she could take him and take care of him. And of course, Kim, the grandmother, said, absolutely, yes, I will take Kai. In January of 2011, Emil returned from Afghanistan for his R&R, rest and recuperation. According to Emil, Bethany met him at the airport and it was here where she confessed her affair. And she also told him that she was five months pregnant. According to most of my resources, it was unclear who the father was, although many presumed that it was Ronald's baby. Emil told Investigation Discovery during that disappeared episode that I told you about earlier, that after Bethany told him about her affair, It felt like he had been punched in the stomach, but he was determined to win his wife's love back. And he continued with their original plans to leave Kai with his grandparents and Bethany and Emil would take their scheduled vacation to Hawaii. And I couldn't find much information of what happened during this almost two week vacation, whether it was fun or whether it wasn't fun, whether there were pictures. I couldn't find any information about that. But according to the Charlie Project, Bethany and Emil got back from Hawaii on January 28th, 2011. On January 29th, which is the next day, Bethany, Emil, and Kai, they were in Columbia, Maryland, visiting with Bethany's mom and Bethany's grandparents. And they were all having a good time, smoking and joking, eating dinner, talking, having a grand time. When Bethany all of a sudden started to get antsy and she became unengaged from the family conversation. At this point, she started paying only attention to her cell phone. And it appeared that her phone was going off nonstop, nonstop, text message after text message. And then all of a sudden, Bethany abruptly got up and said, I, I got to leave. And then she just like left. Later that day, it is unclear when exactly this phone call happened. Bethany calls back to her family in Columbia, Maryland, and they speak on the phone one last time. Sadly, this would be the last time that her family would ever see or hear from Bethany again. That same day, Bethany was scheduled to work a late shift at Carabas, and she called in to confirm, hey, yep, I'm coming in. I'll see you later tonight. Um, What time does my shift start? Okay, cool. I'll be there. But by the time Bethany's shift began, Bethany was nowhere in sight. No call to say that she was running late. No call to say that she was feeling ill. No call to say that she decided to stay home. Nothing. Days went by, and her mom called and left her messages. Bethany's grandparents swung by her house to check on her, 
Friends called to chat, but Bethany didn't respond. Then, oddly, on either February 2nd or February 4th, and the only reason I say both day is because the news articles report either the 2nd or the 4th of February. In any event, in the beginning of February, Emil headed to the airport to make his journey back to Afghanistan. And Bethany had promised him, I am going to be there to see you off. But he waited and waited and waited. And she stood him up. Emil was sad, but just thought she blew him off because as she had stated earlier, she was over him. After Emil left, family continued to leave voicemails for Bethany. Bethany, call me. Bethany, where are you? Bethany, what's going on? never really thinking her radio silence was strange. In fact, they chalked it up to her starting a new semester and having a lot on her plate. Then, friends began to receive messages from Bethany on Facebook. Woohoo! Bethany's back! And they were happy to hear from her. But something seemed off. The content in her messages just seemed weird. It wasn't written in her normal Bethany tone. And one savvy friend started asking questions that only Bethany would know. And the person on the other end, pretending to be Bethany, would just sidestep the question. Let me just say, everyone needs a friend like this. I mean, she's an amazing friend. She's like, something smells fishy. Let me ask her a question that only she would know. And this is when the friend kind of knew that something was going on. Various other people also begin to get these bogus Facebook messages. And then Bethany's army does the right thing. They let Bethany's mother, Kim, Kim Nelson, know that something was off. Bethany's mother lived in Maryland. Bethany lived in Virginia. Bethany's grandparents also lived in Virginia. So when Kim found out that something was off, she decided to tell her parents, hey, you guys live closer, get over there, figure out what's going on, check on Bethany. By this point, it's February 19th, 2011, almost three weeks since anyone had seen Bethany. As Bethany's grandparents arrived to the apartment complex, immediately something is off. The first thing they noticed was Bethany's car, a black Hyundai, had been parked in front of the house. But this time, it was parked crooked. Not only that, but it had a flat tire and had like dust kind of accumulating on it. According to Kim, the grandparents had been by Bethany's house the week earlier and the car was not parked in that manner. But on this particular day, they noticed that it had been moved and then returned. The grandparents knock and nothing. Kim knew at this point it was time to call the police. So grandma called the police 21 days after Bethany had last been seen. The police searched the car, but there were no clues or indications as to where Bethany would have gone. According to Kim, who gave an interview to True Crime Daily, upon entering Bethany's house, the house was even more shocking. The house was empty, except for a bag of Bethany's clothes. By this point, Bethany's bank cards had not been used and the neighbors didn't provide anything helpful. Investigators send out a search team near the house and near where Bethany lived, there was a construction site and they searched this area with humans and dogs. Not only do they search this construction site, but they also search nearby garbage dumpsters, but nothing. The investigators also feared that anyone who would have had something to do with Bethany's disappearance had a three week head start. So this would prove to be a tough case. The police couldn't rule anyone out and they asked Bethany's entire family and people who knew her to be polygraphed. There was one person in particular that the police wanted to talk to, Emil, her husband. But guess what? He was thousands of miles away in Afghanistan. From Afghanistan, Emil agreed to speak to police and he provided any information that they needed to help find Bethany. And once his unit returned to the U.S., Emil agreed to even do a polygraph test and he passed. Early in the investigation, police hear about Ronald and how Bethany and Ronald were living together for about two months before she disappeared. So of course, they're like, okay, let's look for this Ronald dude. And they find him, but he's living at his mother's house, which is odd, right? Because why wouldn't Ronald be freaking out about not being able to find his girlfriend? The one who she couldn't live in peace without having to text message him a freaking picture of where she was at every single moment. But now she's missing. He doesn't report it. And he's like, cool. All right. She's missing. What can I do? So investigators want to talk to Ronald. Ronald agreed. What investigators discover is that Ronald was the last person to see Bethany alive. That day where she was supposed to go to work and didn't, he was the last one to see her. But he said, hey, I don't know where she went. I don't know what happened to her. Like, what? Like, why would I know anything? Kim then tells the police that before Bethany went missing, she had confided in her that things with Ronald weren't the best. In fact, he had a lot of anger issues. And on one occasion, in a fit of rage, Ronald threw Bethany against the wall, threw her across the room, 
and one time he threatened to cut her open with his keys. Bethany wanted Ronald to leave the house, but he wouldn't, and Bethany was too afraid to pack her things and leave. In fact, Bethany even told her mother, I can't leave, he'll just find me. Remember, Bethany was pregnant at the time of her disappearance, and her due date was in August of 2011. The police dig into Ronald's past, and they discover that he has a history of abusing his girlfriends. More than one had been attacked by him. He's a control freak when it comes to the women that he dates. So for now, Ronald is just a person of interest, but they had nothing to hold him on or charge him with. The police even went as far as calling hospitals around the time of Bethany's due date to see if maybe she showed up at the hospital to give birth. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time someone vanished just to reappear as if nothing happened. But the investigators hit a wall. There was no Bethany and no newborn. Since the last time that Bethany was seen, her bank cards hadn't been used, her passport hadn't been used, so the detectives, they were pretty sure that she hadn't left the country. She never showed up to work, and she never showed to class. And just like in episode four, where I cover Air Force Lieutenant Nani Dotson's disappearance, this episode should end here. January 29th, 2011 was the last time anyone saw Bethany, and according to Ronald's admission, he was the last to see her. But the story doesn't really end there. In 2014, Kim, Bethany's mom, was strolling through Facebook when she saw a post about Ronald. He had just been arrested in Pinehurst, North Carolina, for the attempted murder of his then live-in girlfriend, Vicki Willoughby. What? Kim needed more details. And here it is, True Crime Army. In the wee hours of November 12th, 2014, Vicki Willoughby frantically left her house and rang several doorbells. It wasn't until she rang the bell of the third door that someone came to her rescue. The neighbor opened his door carrying a gun after calling 911 thinking that someone was trying to break in. The neighbor was horrified by the sight that he saw. At his door was Vicki Willoughby bleeding. She had just been shot in the face. All right. Let me take you back to the beginning of Vicky's story. Vicky is a mother of three children, and she and Ronald both met while working at Maloney's restaurant in Manassas, Virginia. They dated, and surprise, surprise, Ronald needed a place to live. And Vicky allowed him to stay with her, but he had his own room and everything, so it wasn't like they were cohabiting in, in one room. Ronald had his own room, and Vicky had her room. At some point after he had already moved in with her, Vicky learned about Bethany's disappearance when a friend of hers was watching Nancy Grace and saw that Ronald was a person of interest in Bethany's disappearance. Vicky was kind of like freaking out on the inside, like, who the heck is living in my house? What should I do? I mean, True Crime Army, what would you do? Can you imagine that you're a good Samaritan? You help a friend or a family member or a coworker, and then you find out that they're suspected in someone's disappearance? Seems insane. Well, Vicky confronted Ronald, and she says that his reaction scared the crap out of her. So she quit her job, moved from Virginia to North Carolina, but she actually told Ronald where she was going. And guess what? He followed her. So Vicky spoke to Crime Watch Daily, and she recalled that Ronald used to have what she called, quote, outburst out of nowhere, rages of anger, and they would literally come out of nowhere, end quote. Before long, Vicky found herself in the same position as Bethany, afraid, really afraid. In Vicky's eyes, Ronald was a terror. Ronald was physical with Vicky. She told various outlets some of the things that she experienced with Ronald. Once he grabbed her by the hair, dragged her across the room to the kitchen, bashed her face against the counter until she fell to the floor. And then he threatened to kill her if she ever called the police. This woman was so terrorized by this man that she took two steps to protect herself. One, when Ronald would go to sleep, she would wake up, tiptoe around the house, unlock all the doors, just in case she needed an easy escape. And two, she decided to keep her guns handy and she would hide these guns in strategic locations around the house so that she could defend herself easily if needed. And she would change the locations every so often just in case he found them, she would hide them in a different place. And on this particular day, she had one gun under the couch and another gun under the dog bed. And Ronald was in the room. So Vicky's in the living room, Ronald's in the room. 
Vicky, she had her computer on her lap and her cell phone on top of the computer. When all of a sudden, Vicky described Ronald walk into the room, set her electronics on the couch and initiate a beating that she thought she wasn't gonna survive. He grabbed her by the nap of the hair, snapped her neck and wailed on her. He ripped off her shirt. He kicked her, punched her, bit her as she attempted to get away. She dropped to the ground and began crawling to the couch. She needed to get her hands on that gun. So she reaches for the revolver. She grabs it. She grabs hold of it. But now she's like crawling like a baby. Freaking Ronald is on her back. She describes she's trying to shoot this guy from like with her non-dominant hand while she's crawling, while she's getting beat down. She turns in this like unnatural position, shoots the weapon, hitting him twice, one above the heart and once in his abdomen. Vicky, though, describes that these shots had zero effect on Ronald. In fact, she said that the shots fueled his anger even more. So he freaking wrestles the gun out of her hands and turns the 38 caliber gun on her, shooting her multiple times, landing one shot straight through her face and one in her leg. Vicky remembered just succumbing to the shots and laying down as if she was just like preparing for death to come at any moment. Ronald then got up, went to the other room, probably to like take care of his himself, his own wounds. As Vicky lay there waiting for death to come, she starts to realize, I don't think I'm going to die. So then she has blood everywhere. She crawls to the door, opens it and then runs to get help from neighbors. The thing is, Vicky had imagined this very moment many times since being with Ronald. And in this moment, she wasn't even sure if he was coming after her. So instead of knocking on doors and giving away her position, instead, she chose to ring the doorbell. Can you imagine? She, this woman had just been shot in the face and she has the wherewithal to figure out that if she knocks really loudly and he's behind her somewhere, he's going to find her. So instead, she rings the doorbell. So the first house no answer. Second house, no answer. Third house, finally, a door opens and she was swept inside. The door closed behind her and the police, they're already on their way. And when the police arrive at Vicky's house, Ronald was still there. He didn't resist arrest. Vicky was taken to the hospital and Ronald was charged with attempted murder. Do you ever get sick of how many times you're scrambling to figure out dinner plans? I mean, dinner is every night. How can someone be so unprepared for a daily task? I'm super guilty of this sometimes. Well, fret no more, because with HelloFresh, you never have to worry about what's for dinner. Because HelloFresh will deliver farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes directly to your doorstep. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with only one third the sodium in other meals. This month, the dietitian win menu includes pecan crusted chicken, one pan spiced turkey lettuce wrap, creamy Dijon dill chicken, and Southwest stuffed green peppers. I recently tried the Southwest stuffed green peppers and they are delicious. And while this meal appeals hardcore and hard to make, the recipe was super easy to follow. It took roughly 30 minutes to make the entire meal, so I call that a win. HelloFresh is truly life-changing. No more worrying about mealtime. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60. That's Military M-A-M-A and the number 60. And use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60 and use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. When Vicky was interviewed, she wasted no time in telling the detectives about Ronald's missing ex-girlfriend, Bethany. Vicky, at this point, now she knew that Ronald probably had something to do with Bethany's disappearance. In fact, during Vicky and Ronald's relationship, he had told her during an argument that he knew how to make people disappear. As a result of being shot in the face, Vicky lost her right eye. Until this day, she still has the bullet lodged in her head. After the attempted murder, Vicky contacted Kim Nelson, Bethany's mom. And Kim told Crime Watch that Vicky told her that she really wanted to be a voice for Bethany. People needed to know. If you go and watch the Crime Watch Daily YouTube video, 
you can actually see when Kim and Vicky, after collaborating and talking for a very long time, they actually met in person for the very first time. Can you imagine? Allies who had never met. And the moment that they meet for the first time, it's caught on video. So I think it's, you guys should go watch it. But wait, there's more. Between Bethany's 2011 disappearance and Vicky's late 2014 attempted murder, there was another woman who fell prey to Ronald, a woman named April, who was also a waitress. On April 23rd, 2014, the Daily Mail reported that Ronald saw some text messages on his then-girlfriend April's phone, and he became enraged and jealous and irate, and he was accusing her of cheating. So he put all of April's things in the front yard, pushed her down the stairs, spat in her face while yanking her arm. For this offense, he paid a $2,500 fine and the charges involving April were dropped. In May of 2016, in Vicky's case, Ronald pled guilty to two reduced charges, felony assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, and felony assault inflicting serious bodily injury. He received six years to eight and a half years in prison. As reported by WTOP, after Ronald's trial, prosecutors said that after he serves his sentence, he is being immediately deported to Bolivia. Vicky wasn't happy about the plea deal because now she fears that he's either going to get out and come after her or he's going to get out and basically hurt someone else. I mean, because that's his M.O. But according to the district attorney, Peter Strickland, it would have been difficult to win an attempted murder conviction, especially because Vicky fired the first shots. Oh, what? Okay. Let's unpack this just a little bit. It's just shocking, right? She's she's an abused woman and she was being attacked, but then she turned and shot him and then he turned and shot her. And so is he saying it's self-defense? Okay, let's unpack it. At first glance, when I first saw that, I, I thought it was outrageous. Like what? This guy, Ronald, is a criminal. But then I was like, okay, let me look this up just a little bit. And according to the criminaldefenselawyer.com website, Self-defense is about reasonableness. If someone throws a shoe at you and you respond by knifing them, well, that's not really self-defense, right? Because it, was, it wasn't reasonable for you to believe that a shoe was going to cause death or grave bodily harm, right? Probably not. But if someone takes a knife out on you and you take your gun out, well, that's more reasonable, right? Because you could be killed to death with the knife, could respond in a reasonable manner. So this hypothetical is, you know, kind of ridiculous because like common sense, right? But, you know, you get the gist. So although I was initially enraged by the DA's response, I do think that the DA was just erring on the side of caution and potentially getting an acquittal verdict. Although Vicky did say that at the initiation of the beating, he snapped her neck. And she actually talks about how, like, she heard her neck snap. He did it in a sense, to kill her, I guess, but he he just wasn't successful. I think Vicky would have had a clear self-defense argument if she would have killed Ronald that night. But I wonder what would have happened to Ronald if Vicky would have died. Would he have been convicted of murder or something else? I guess at that point, we would only have his words, but thankfully, we didn't have to find that out. But it's still an interesting question to ponder. I'd like to bring us back to Bethany's disappearance. At the end of it all, Kim has not given up hope of finding answers for her daughter. And after all of the campaigning that Kim participated in, Kim asks the public for help with information. Kim still has hope that someone can help bring closure to the family. Surely the number one wish is that Bethany comes home unhurt. But at the end of the day, Kim just wants closure. In 2013, Kim told thepatch.com, quote, Her three-year-old son will ask, where's mommy? And all I can say is that I don't know, but God is with her. We are praying that someone has information on the details of her disappearance and will have the courage to come forward, end quote. In 2016, after Ronald was sent to prison for his assault on Vicky, Kim told WTOP, quote, I am hoping that him being behind bars will allow someone who has information about Bethany to come forward so there can be justice for Bethany. I pray that their heart would be moved to do the right thing so their conscience can be clear, end quote. Detectives have not stopped investigating Bethany's disappearance. In fact, detectives took the opportunity while Ronald was in prison to keep digging into her disappearance. 
and on June 15, 2016, they obtained Ronald's phone, tablet, and laptop. And on July 7, 2016, as reported by the Loudoun Times, the Loudoun County Sheriff's detectives filed a search warrant seeking information from those electronics that, according to the article, could lead to Bethany's whereabouts. Bethany was only three classes shy of getting her degree when she disappeared, but she never returned to class again. In January of 2019, eight years, eight years, eight years after the disappearance of Bethany Decker, Loudoun County Sheriff Mike Chapman told WTOP, quote, we have had movement as recently as last week, end quote, in the eight-year search to determine who killed 21-year-old Bethany Decker, who was five months pregnant when she last saw her live-in boyfriend in their Ashburn, Virginia apartment. The sheriff wouldn't specify, but said that the development came after a January 2019 search warrant of Decker's Facebook account. Something that I discovered after reading the 2019 WTOP article was the Emil had also received a strange email or Facebook messages from Bethany as well, back when he was in Afghanistan. According to public records, Ronald has been in jail since May 13th, 2016, His next custody review is on February 1st, 2020, just in a few days. However, if he is not released then, then his projected release date is November 10th, 2020. I'm going to be posting a picture of Bethany on all of my social media accounts and also a picture of Ronald in all of my uh, social media accounts. Bethany is white, has brown hair and brown eyes. She's four foot 11 inches tall and was about 130 pounds when she was last seen. Anyone, anyone with information about Bethany Decker's disappearance or with information about Ronald or really information about anyone connected to this case should contact the Loudoun County Crime Solvers at 703-777-1919. Any tip, no matter how small or insignificant you might think, could help bring Bethany home. If you or anyone you know is suffering in a physically or emotionally abusive relationship, you can get help you can call the National Defense Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-3224. You can also visit their website at www.thehotline.org. There's many resources, including resources for those being abused, for the family and friends of those being abused, for survivors, and even for abusers. What do you guys think? Is there anyone else that the police really need to keep a closer eye on besides just Ronald? I'm interested in your theories. So, of course, reach out on my social media, Military Murder Podcast on Instagram, at Military True Crime on Facebook, and Military Murder on Twitter. This week marks the nine-year anniversary of Bethany's disappearance, which is why I chose this case. And wouldn't it be great for investigators to crack this case and find Bethany this year? Listen, True Crime Army, please share this episode with everyone you know. Share via text message, via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Maybe someone was living in the area or knew someone who was living in the area. Or maybe they know somebody who knows somebody. You get the picture. Share this episode so that we can help keep this case alive until it is solved. So as you all know, Ronald is set to get out of jail this year and will likely be deported. If he had anything to do with Bethany's disappearance, the investigators' chances of catching him after he's deported are pretty slim. So let's be vigilant. Thanks for listening. This show was created and produced by Mama Margot Productions. All of the music was created by Tie Ups. To find a list of all the sources that I pieced together to bring you this story, I encourage you to go to www.militarymurderpodcast.com to check out the links. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you a military murder story next week. Let's work on our podcast.